North Korea threatens to retaliate thousands of times against the U.S. for sponsoring a new set of tougher economic sanctions. North Korea reacted to the new U.N. sanctions, vowing thousands-fold revenge against the U.S. These sanctions are a big, important step to squeeze the North, to try to change their behavior. But so far, North Korea is just striking right back. Overnight, those new threats from North Korea, promises on state television to reciprocate a thousandfold for what it calls America's villainous actions against our country and people, warning that if the U.S. thinks it will be safe because it is across an ocean, there is no bigger misunderstanding than that. Let me begin with this. Uh, sanctions worked against Iran. In other cases, they do not work. Will they work against North Korea? And what circumstances will allow them to work? I think it's unlikely, Charlie, that the sanctions will ultimately work, meaning that they would convince the North Koreans to give up their nuclear weapons. I would say, however, this was a victory for the Trump administration to see these sanctions, to convince China and Russia to join. But the North Koreans prize above all else the possession of these nuclear weapons. They're testing ballistic missiles. They're modernizing the weapons. And for us, for the Americans, the real danger is that within a couple of years, they could have the capacity to have a nuclear weapon that could reach the western part of the United States. I think the Trump administration has said quite rightly that is an unacceptable threat. So I think what we're likely to see is a continuing ratcheting up of these sanctions by the U.S. in the future. Well, will they work in the end? I'm afraid I don't think they will because I don't think China will join them. No. China has the most leverage here. They provide most of the energy and most of the food. They, of course, just to the north of North Korea. And this was significant. They joined the sanctions. Significant today that in Manila, the Chinese foreign minister was so tough on the North Koreans. But ultimately, the Chinese don't want to see very tough sanctions and pressure on North Korea because they don't want to see the regime collapse. They don't want to see refugees go into China. They don't want to see the Korean Peninsula unified by the South Korean government aligned with the United States because that would be a victory strategically for this long-running competition between China and the United States in Asia. At a regional summit in the Philippines, Secretary of State Rex Tillerson offered to negotiate if the North stops testing missiles and halts its nuclear weapons program. He spoke after the U.N. Security Council unanimously approved the sanctions. North Korea said in a statement overnight, quote, we will pursue our ambitions to maintain supremacy of nuclear power forever by launching intercontinental ballistic missiles. We won't stop for anyone, no matter what they say. Juliana Goldman is at the State Department. Juliana, good morning. Good morning. The world's top diplomats are putting on a full court press to make sure these latest sanctions against North Korea are actually carried out. Secretary of State Rex Tillerson is leaving the door open to negotiating with North Korea, but as far as a time frame, he says we'll know it when we see it. That would be the first and strongest signal they could send to us is just stop, stop these missile launches. At a Monday press Obviously conference, Secretary of State Rex Tillerson said North Korea must stop their missile launches for an extended period. This is not uh, give me 30 days and we're ready to talk. It's not quite that simple. Ambassador, it seems like we have the same conversation uh, over and over again about North Korea. No good options. You can't bomb, can't negotiate, you, you can't really contain them. So what is the game changer here? Because you hear Secretary of State Rex Tillerson describing what he would like to see as a precondition for talks. Well, Margaret, I think you're right. I mean, the, the North Koreans are very different than the Iranians. You remember a couple of years ago, these tremendous financial and economic oil and gas sanctions on Iran. Iran's a trading nation. It wanted to be connected economically to the rest of the world. So those sanctions work to drive them to the negotiating table. The North Korea, North Korea is a hermit kingdom. They're isolated. They don't trade with many countries. And I think Kim Jong-un, this young leader of North Korea, believes that his possession of nuclear weapons is his ultimate protection 
against any foe, most especially the United States. Uh, Ambassador, they said that North Koreans did yesterday, we won't stop for anyone, no matter what they say. Does that mean simply that we're going to have to, in the end, acquiesce to the idea that they have nuclear weapons deliverable to the west coast of the United States? I hope not. And I think what, what, there's an interim step here, Charlie. Secretary Tillerson has been hinting that we ought to talk to the North Koreans, not to be nice to them, but perhaps to negotiate some kind of interim arrangement where they might freeze or limit their testing of nuclear weapons, their development of nuclear weapons, and also of ICBMs, intercontinental ballistic missiles. That's a messy compromise. But it'd be a lot better than the current situation. They're not constrained right now, and they are racing towards a nuclear weapon, and that's a real threat to our country. were approved unanimously on Saturday by the United Nations Security Council and included the support of Russia and China. The UN estimates it could slash the North's export revenue by a third after imposing a ban on exports of coal, iron, lead and seafood. The package also bars other nations from importing North Korean products. This is the most stringent set of sanctions on any country in a generation. U.N. Ambassador Nikki Haley said the sanctions would cripple Pyongyang. These sanctions will give the North Korean leadership a taste of the deprivation they have chosen to inflict on the North Korean people. But that's only if China stays on board. At the ASEAN conference, China took an uncharacteristically stern posture, telling North Korea's foreign minister that the regime needed to calm down, accept the sanctions, and not retaliate. But Beijing also urged the U.S. and South Korea to cease military operations and remove the U.S. THAAD anti-missile system, something neither country accepts. Our annual joint military exercises have been carried out regularly and openly for nearly 40 years. They will continue. China is the big question mark here. In the past, they've gone along with sanctions only to eventually back away. And, Charlie, the other overriding concern here is whether or not this is too late. Uh, it's going to take some time for the sanctions to go into effect. And meanwhile, North Korea is continuing to develop its nuclear missile technology. Uh, the president is staying busy, though, monitoring a new round of threats from North Korea. For more on this, we bring in Franco Ordonez. He is the White House correspondent for McClatchy Newspapers. Thanks for joining us, Franco. Thanks for having me. So we've heard some pretty inflammatory stuff out of North Korea uh, reacting to the news of this, the new uh, U.N. sanctions. Uh, North Korea saying that America, they're ready to teach America a severe lesson that, uh, that their intercontinental missiles are within firing range of the U.S. And we dip back into a tool we've used over and over again, more sanctions. How will these sanctions be any different? Well, I mean, I think that's that's a tell. I mean, will will people, will the region, will the countries, will the other countries say China continue to back these sanctions? I mean, the increased amount of these rounds of uh, testing has raised more concern in the area, um, around the region. South Korea is extremely concerned. South Korea is not only, ex but South Korea is not only concerned about North Korea. They're also concerned about what the Trump administration will do. We've been reporting uh, how they are actually considering uh, building and developing their own nuclear arsenal just in case uh, they can't count on the United States. So. There is, this is a, high, the tensions are rising and rising in this area. Right. Uh, you know, bringing that up, that is, I'm sure, a primary concern for all parties involved, the rising tension in that area. From a strategic perspective, how can the president defuse the rising tension? That's a, you know, that's the million dollar question. I mean, I can say that in, you know, other country scenarios like this, just take Venezuela, for example, where tensions are rising. The government has largely tried to not do it unilaterally. They've tried to do it from a regional aspect. They've tried to get other neighbors involved. That appears to be what they're trying to do with the U.N. as well, getting other countries, uh, the U.N., uh, you know, allies together, um, supporting this. They're even trying to get Russia. Obviously, Russia is being involved to a certain degree. They want China. China needs to stick to the package. So uh, the idea is not to go at it alone.
All right, let's get first to our top story this hour, fresh provocations from North Korea. The North is now vowing to boost its nuclear arsenal and launch, quote, thousands fold revenge against the U.S. after the United Nations Council unanimously approved crippling new sanctions to punish the country over its recent missile launches. President Trump cheered the sanctions, tweeting this. Just completed call with President Moon of South Korea. Very happy and impressed with 15-0 United Nations vote on North Korea sanctions. Here's what U.S. Ambassador Nikki Haley uh, had to say about those sanctions, potential military options, and regime change when she sat down with Maria Bartiromo yesterday on Sunday Morning Futures. What we basically did was um, kicked him in the stomach, told him to stop, and said we're not going to put up with it anymore, and the ball is now in North Korea's court. They have a big decision to make. It, it, they can either respond by pulling back and saying that they're not going to be a part of this reckless activity anymore, or they can see where it goes, and we'll continue to keep up the strength and keep up the activity to make sure that we stop them. Are you considering a military option? Troops on the ground? What does that mean? You know, I, what it means is the United States are going to always keep our options on the table. You know, we have those military exercises that we have with South Korea. Those have been happening for 40 years. They're very transparent, but they're also meant to defend our allies and, and to make sure that North Korea knows that we're going to be um, continuing those exercises. That's not going to stop. What will happen is North Korea has the opportunity to do the right thing. And by stopping this reckless behavior, we will now see. But the United States will respond based on North Korea's actions. We hope that they don't do anything further. We hope that they stop this reckless activity. We hope we don't have to do anything. But all options have always been on the table. Welcome back. Uh, President Trump tweeting overnight after an urgent phone call with his South Korean counterpart, applauding a unanimous U.N. vote to impose a massive sanctions bill on North Korea amid some new threats from the rogue regime. Here to explain the significance of these sanctions, Hudson Institute fellow and national security expert Rebecca Heinrichs. Rebecca, thank you so much for joining us this morning. Good morning, Heather. So we've heard about sanctions before on North Korea. Why are these different? Let's begin there. Well, first of all, you know, there's this myth that there was nothing else to sanction in North Korea. And Nikki Haley and President Trump uh, and Rex Tillerson, our Secretary of State, proved that wrong. Um, this is a major foreign policy accomplishment for the Trump administration because these are massive, sweeping sanctions. Um, and that we got everybody on board at the U.N. Security Council is a big deal. So this is going to really squeeze the North Korean regime about um, as a much uh, up to a third of, the, uh, of their um, export revenues mm -hmm. um, that they make. Now, the key now is the is to see if China is actually going to enforce these sanctions and if China isn't going to look for other opportunities to make up for the revenue loss right. for the and North Koreans. We'll talk a little bit more about China, but let's take a look specifically out at the sanctions, which have been approved, as we mentioned, 15 to 0 unanimously across the board. Uh, supposedly will um, uh, ban coal and other exports worth over $1 billion. You can see the other exports there in addition to coal. But you were referencing China, and I know specifically in terms of the um, sanctions that have been placed before on North Korea, coal specifically was one that China, you know, disregarded. Well, um, there was some indication that there have, may have been a little bit of a dip um, with Chinese imports, but then what the Chinese did uh, was, well, first of all, there was a, there's a humanitarian loophole that said that if some of the Chinese exports, the revenues that was made, went to the, the North Korean civilians, that that would be acceptable. But that was a, that was a farce. I and mean, the North Koreans don't care about their civilians. They don't care about their people. And so all of that money, all of that revenue actually went to the military and to the missile program. So there are no more loopholes um, like that. Uh, but again, the Chinese Chinese, even when, when things like coal were sanctioned, mm -hmm. the Chinese looked for other opportunities to increase, for instance, seafood and minerals and other goods like that. But those are covered in the sanctions that were just passed. And so, again, this is really going to squeeze the regime as long as they're enforced. And there were some other things that we didn't get. One of them was oil. Is that right? That's correct, and the North Koreans rely um, uh, on that as well. And so there's other, there's more headroom here if we want to push down further on the regime. And again, I've talked about this before on your show too. There's there's secondary sanctions. There's in Malaysia and Singapore and China um, and African countries. There are also banks and that, that are propping up the financial networks of the North Koreans too. That also prop up the regime. And so there's still other things that we can do, but this is a very significant step. Mm -hmm. And it also shows that the Trump administration does have significant. Leadership 
leadership clout in the world that they're able to push this and get some really good, solid biting sanctions that can really clamp down on the regime and, and stop the money from pouring into their missile program. And do you think Russia will cooperate? I think so. I mean, you know, the, the Trump, again, President Trump sort of has this reputation of being um, unpredictable. People aren't really sure. And I think you have the Russians and the Chinese who are now looking at this president and saying, he's serious about this North Korean regime, and we better get on board because we don't know what he's going to do because the American government will not allow the North Koreans mm -hmm. to threaten the American people with a nuclear capable ballistic missile. And that is, a, that is something that they've demonstrated that they likely have the capability to do now. Now yeah, we have to get it under control. We'll see if they cooperate this time. Let me ask you about regime change. Is there an effort underway uh, to launch a coup with the generals in North Korea to have the generals take over? The United States is not pushing for regime change. We never have been. What we've said is stop the activity. Our goal is to make North Korea become secure. We want to see a peaceful and secure North Korea. We want to see the region secure. We want to see the Korean Peninsula secure. But we've never pushed for regime change. First of all, Congressman, I want to get your response to, to Nikki Haley. All options are on the table. Well, they always need to be on the table, but the Trump administration deserves a lot of credit. To post up a 15 to nothing Security Council vote is, is very important. Um, it, it, the key to this obviously resides with China. Uh, I was in uh, South Korea uh, meeting with local officials there, talking to uh, our partners in Japan as well. And if, if, if North Korea continues to be able to access the Korean market, to the uh, Chinese market through the black market, then it really then won't, it, it, it won't make the fundamental difference in change. It's a very difficult border there on the northern part of North Korea. But that's up to the Chinese. And they, but to, for them to vote in favor of this, I think, was a very positive. So to ask the question about whether or not China will strictly implement the UN resolution, your answer would be? Well, again, when you look at that long border there on that map, you're, you're going to see that there's a lot of black market trading that is going on. So if you're really trying to cripple them, um, the, but we also have to have the military imperative, and that's where we do have a great relationship with South Korea, with, with Japan. But we also, again, need China to weigh in and make sure that uh, this leader knows that he has no options but to, to communicate and try to work something you're out giving, rather than the military. You're giving the president a lot of credit for his efforts here. How is that playing over with his base politically? I think there's so many different things to be looking at right now that it's hard to say. I think his base is excited by everything that he's doing. and. Um, I think the strength that they're showing here is, is something that's is also that, that, that people are really, really standing behind. I think there's a lot of concern about North Korea. Um, I think there's been so much focus on so many different issues in the administration that people are confused. I think those people who are on the fence and on the left are looking at everything really, really skeptically. They're looking at this and saying, okay, sanctions, they're one thing. And, and the UN, I mean, they, I, I've, I've heard folks who say, you know, you're, you're the same person who's criticized the UN for saying nothing, and now you're mm -hmm. bragging about your win in the UN. So it is a really, really dicey time out there, and people are really conflicted, but I think his base is, is right and squarely in his corner. And meanwhile, Secretary of State Rex Tillerson says North Korea can show it's ready for negotiations by, first of all, stopping missile launches. So what do you make of Tillerson offering these preconditions for talks with the North, Kirsten? Well, I mean, obviously, I, this is a great chance, I think, too, for Secretary of State Tillerson to finally come into his mm. limelight here because uh, he has not necessarily been able to exercise um, some of the leadership of former Secretary of States because of all the other, you know, the different um, dynamics. Uh, dynamics within the White House. <laughs> I mean, the different centers of power, you know, so this is an opportunity for him to come out very strong. Um, what, what is interesting, a dynamic here insofar as talks, negotiations are concerned, is the election of President Moon in South Korea just recently, um, because he was someone who ran a little more dovish on North Korea, saying that talks were more of an option rather than a very hard line and more of a military stance. Mm. And that is a shift and a change. So I think Secretary Tillerson is responding to that um, and putting talks more on the table. But what has worked? You know, what has worked in the two decades now, almost you know, three, that we've I mean, been dealing with this? You know, what has worked? Negotiations? I mean, military, you know, the threat of military action, has it worked? And, for, worked? and for North Korea's part, um, they're calling these sanctions a violent infringement of its sovereignty that was caused by a heinous U.S. plot to isolate and stifle North Korea. Uh, it said the U.S. U.N. sanctions will never force the country to negotiate over its nuclear pro program or to give up its push to strengthen its nuclear capability. So going back to your original point, Congress. Well, it, it, Rex Tillerson does, deserves a lot of credit, too. They, when I was there and met with the foreign minister, uh, 
when we had a chance to interact with him in South Korea, they had already met four times. And yet you never read about that in the mainstream media. Mm -hmm. So the real, uh, relationship that we have with, with South Korea is imperative. Japan is obviously a big part of that. But of course we've got to cripple them economically because we don't want them to be the purveyors of terror and we don't want them to be able to access the materials that they need to develop these nuclear mm -hmm. capabilities. And I think it's part of the process that has to happen. I mean, we've seen that this is a leader who's willing to starve his people by saying we're going to, you know, we're going to, who cares about sanctions? I'm going to let all these people die. You know, he's a very, very different kind of person than any of us can imagine negotiating with. But I think it's part of the process that we need to go through because if we just went straight to something more aggressive, that's really dangerous as well. So I um and think of how overcommitted our forces already are. And we still haven't heard from General Mattis and, and some of the other generals on our strategy moving forward in Afghanistan, where we're, you know, very overstretched, you know, at this point, and we can't keep troops there forever, right? Everyone agrees on that, no matter how much we want to see that country stable and strong in the region, right? So really have to balance our military commitments around the world, you know, and a lot of um, President Trump's base, as you mentioned, Lee, so, uh, so.